Founded in 1991 by patients, the FSHD Society is the largest grassroots network of FSHD patients, their families, and research activists. The FSHD Society offers a community of support, news, and information for the millions of people affected by FSHD worldwide. This is FSHD Society Radio. Welcome to the FSHD Society Radio Show. Thanks for being here on yet another episode as we are embarking into 2024, the second episode here in January. So excited because this guest we have in store reached out to the show, believe it or not. And it wasn't her mother like the last guest we had, which is fine. You can you can definitely do that too. Uh, but uh, I'm excited to bring her in. But first, make sure you're going to fshdsociety.org. Check out all the events, things that are going on. There's either local chapters that you can get a part of or be a part of. There's a lot of virtual meetings going on. I mean, the list is 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 kind of endless of what you can dive into. Um, in a couple of weeks, those volunteers out there, I think the volunteer summit's coming up. So make sure that the volunteers watching, listening, that uh, you're all lined up and ready to go for that. That's happening in my neck of the woods here uh, in uh, Chicago, which is a little south of, of my location. So those volunteers, make sure you're in tune for that. That's my gentle reminder. Um, and, uh, yeah, without further ado, I'd love to bring this guest. I'm super excited because I've watched, uh, the YouTube channel that she has out there, um, disabled in nature. We welcome in Marissa an FSH -er as, as myself and others that are listening and watching. Welcome Marissa. Hi. Thanks so much for having me on. Absolutely. Thanks for asking to come on. Yeah. yeah you know, I thought yeah. about like telling my mom, like, Hey, go recommend me for this <laughs> podcast, but, uh, figured I'd just do it myself, you know, cut out the middleman. <laughs> well, you know, if you think that she would have, I mean, I, I obviously accept those as well. You know, those, <laughs> those invitations from uh, family, um, uh, because you never know. I think, I think my mother would do, would have done the same thing. I, I mentioned that on the last episode, she's probably like my, uh, slightly biggest critic in a gentle way you know tim you could really do this better or you know you ever think about having this kind of guest on so yeah no it was it was great that we're, we're we're kind of referring to the uh chelsea moeller episode uh the first one of 2024 where her mom <laughs> reached out to us to have her on because she has a great blog to talk about um and i guess there is that little bit of a parallel a little bit between between you and her where she has the blog you have a youtube uh channel Disabled in Nature, which I love the title. I, I said that to you before we started the record button. And I like those kind of titles, you know, and uh, uh, just the plan words and things, just a lot of fun. Uh, and it kind of gets my attention. So um, before we get too deep, though, I guess I'd love to, to kind of start with your FSHD story because you're a person that has the disease like myself and others that are listening and watching. So um, kind of give us your your diagnosis, I guess, your FSHD story. Sure. Um, so I feel like the more and more people I talk to in the community, the more that I find that this is a unique experience of that I've always known that I've had FSHD um, oh. and can trace it back four or five generations in my family. Um, so uh, unlike a lot of people that have had, you know, like stories of they started having weakness and they didn't really know what was going on and they went to seek a diagnosis, I can only imagine how scary that would be. Um, I never had that. I always knew what it was and kind of what my future might look like. Um, so I have early onset FSHD. I have always had weakness in my face and my shoulders and my arms. Um, and then around the sixth or seventh grade, I started getting lower body weakness, um, transitioned into using um, AFOs in high school, and then a mobility scooter uh, probably far too late after my undergrad. Um, and I've been a full-time power wheelchair user for about four years now. I'm in my late twenties. Okay. Okay. So the early onset, interesting that you bring that up because it's been definitely a part of the community. I don't want to say it was ignored, but just kind of like, wait a minute, You're right. Young people have this and they get it very early. It seems to affect them very quickly. Uh, attacks a little more stronger. Yeah. It's a little mm -hmm. more, uh, it's a little more difficult, and uh, it's uh, it's 
to me, it's uh, devastating just even to talk about it because it affects young people. You're you're younger than me for sure. Um, you know, everybody knows about 48 years old. So we're like, what, like 20 some ish, you know, years apart. I was only diagnosed when I was 40. I did not wow. know what, what was going on with my body when I was just a little bit younger than that. It definitely did not happen for me necessarily in my teens, maybe slight little things, but nothing, nothing aggressive. Yeah. So um, talk about that, I guess. I know that um, you say that it wasn't necessarily a surprise because it was in your family for generations. Um, but being a young person, you know, going back to when you were, you know, sixth, seventh grade and high school with the AFOs, you know, what was that? What what was that world like to navigate? Not only a tough time for everybody, high school, growing up, but then having FSHD on top of it. Hmm, that's a wonderful question, um, and that's actually kind of like a lot of what I want to address with my mm-hmm. YouTube channel is like telling that story. Um, so, my dad had early onset as well. Um, he started showing symptoms in in middle school, I believe. So for me, it was, like I said, it was always kind of like expected for me that like, and I didn't really think much of it until I started losing strength in my lower body. Um, and until that happened, you know, like middle school, mid middle school, it, it didn't really seem to affect me very much. You know, I was a very, very active kid. I did all of the, you know, regular kid stuff. I would run and climb trees probably much higher than I should have. Um, I was, I was very, very active. I ran track in the seventh grade right before Mm -hmm. I lost the ability to run over the next like two or three months. Um, so it's definitely true what you say that it happens very, very fast. Um, I actually have a, by the time this airs, I'll have a video out about my experience of the summer that I lost the ability to run. Um, so I think it didn't really hit me until that time. And once that happened, that's when, you know, I was around 13 or 14. And I think that age range was really tricky because I had grown up, you know, with this passion for running and being active. And I was coming into myself as a person just as that was kind of taken away from me. Um, so I think that the hardest thing, you know, obviously losing the ability to run and eventually to walk entirely was difficult, but for me, it was mostly the grief of that, you know, and that's a grief journey that a lot of people don't have to go on until they're, you know, older until they're in their sixties or seventies or, you know, much later, even people that, you know, have FSHD, some people never have to go through that journey. So I think that particularly as a young person, that the emotional side of it was, was the worst part. Um, there was also the, you know, and I understand why this happened, but I was raised kind of in the sort of in the denial space of like, don't talk about it. We don't need to bring this out in the open. Um, and I know that that's because, you know, because it has existed so long in my family that when my grandfather was experiencing his muscle decline it was probably in like the 50s and 60s Mm. and definitely then you didn't talk about disability so that's how he raised my dad and so even though i feel like my dad certainly improved upon some things that happened in his childhood um that was kind of the space he was in when he was raising me too so i suffered in silence a lot Mm. and i didn't reach out to people i didn't have conversations i only met the first person that was not genetically related to me with FSHD, um, like less than two years ago. Um, so I know it's, it's rare in our community is pretty isolated, but, um, yeah. Wow. It's, 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 it's definitely a subject matter I wanted to address because, um, we've only talked about early onset a handful of times. Shame on me. Right. I mean, <laughs> we've been talked about sooner. Uh, we have now a group within the FSHD society that that meet um, about you know early onset. It's like call it their own chapter, so to speak, their own group to talk about those things because it's a whole different it's a whole different can of problems. I mean, yeah. just so much, just so much is it just I just can't even <laughs> put into words what those struggles could possibly be like. Uh, Man, it, it was rough for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it, it, it's just it's just damn not fair. It's just straight out, you know. It's it's it just isn't. Life's hard enough. And um, you want to be able to have fun and do those things that other kids are doing and so forth. And uh, I'm glad that at least you got to experience 
the running, right? The track. Um, mm -hmm. That must have been at least a fun experience. Um, I took it for granted when I was younger and I wasn't very fast. Um, I only made the track team because I was the only guy that was willing to run the two mile race. So that's why I, <laughs> I don't think I won one ever. Wow. But, you know, at least that, uh, you know, I could say, hey, I did experience those things. I did play the football and the baseball and all that kind of stuff. And, and then 40 hit and, well, you know, things do happen when you're 40 anyway, you know. And when people are younger, there's just more things that are going on that they're trying to navigate, let alone this. Um, so, yeah, I'm glad that we, that we kind of at least talked about it. And I'm really interested to know when, that, when your episode comes out, if it's, you know, you start drifting that direction with, with uh, some of your YouTube uh, episodes about that, that would be really interesting. Yeah, it is going to be the first yeah. first installment of many, probably. Yeah. Um, what what area of the country do you do you live in? Do you say I'm in Michigan? the southeast Michigan area. The southeast Michigan area. Mm -hmm. So, what's like weather like for you there? Is that a challenge to navigate with power equipment? What's it like right now? Uh, right now, we're in that like week and a half of the polar blast. So, like the Sub zero temperatures. The feels like has been below negative fifteen Fahrenheit for several many days in a row. Nice. Um, and right before that happened, we got a big snowfall, and then everything froze over. So there is snow everywhere, ice everywhere. Um, needless to say, I haven't left my house in a bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, because yeah. it's it is very difficult. And something else that I talk on my channel quite a bit about is the transportation issues that come along with having a disability, especially when needing to use a 400 pound power wheelchair. Right. I've been in a near two year long battle to get funding, mm -hmm. to get an accessible van because I don't have $106,000 to buy one. As, um, most I don't see why not. Know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Geez. Really? You know, get it together. Just buy yeah. it. Um, that's insane, right? Yeah. I mean, why is it that difficult? Are you finding that even when you when you got the uh, power uh, wheelchair that you have, um, those aren't cheap either. No. So, I mean, I worked at Home Care Medical, our local company. Uh, they've changed hands since, but I was a purchasing agent. I was firsthand in knowing how much medical equipment really costed and how much people were really being charged. Yeah. It's insane. And yeah, even though they I, are expensive uh... pieces, but yeah, how about that journey of it being so expensive even to get that? That was also difficult and took nearly a year to get my custom power chair that I'm sitting in right now um, that I can't leave my house with because, again, I don't have the van. Um, when I leave right now, I have a, a portable, foldable power chair that I, you know, have to, like, stand up. And it weighs, like, 60 pounds, and I have to shove it into the back of my car with this lift thing. I have a video on my channel of, like, giving a tour of it and how I get in and out of my car. Um, obviously, with winter, I can't really do that because if I stand on ice, I will fall down and break myself. Yeah. Um, but as far as the, the power wheelchair goes, um, uh, I call it the great insurance debacle of 2023. <laughs> um, in which like I was switching jobs and my job I had at the beginning of the year had super amazing insurance. And then I was going to switch onto my husband's insurance. But when we put the order for the wheelchair through, they were like, interesting thing. Uh, there's a rider, like a, and of course, you can't see these documents before you choose the insurance plan, right? So there's a writer on his insurance that says it that um, durable medical equipment, so wheelchairs, doesn't count towards the co-insurance maximum. Oh. So this wheelchair that I thought, you know, would be, I think our maximum was like $2,000 or something. So this wheelchair that was going to be $2,000 was going to be $20,000. Oh, my gosh. Um, so I had to like go on Cobra for my old job. It was super expensive. It was like a whole thing. Um, but in the end, the bill for the wheelchair was around $38,000. Um, that insurance paid for all of it because I kept the really good insurance for my employer. But yeah. yeah, that's a whole, I don't know. That's one of the things that I would like to explore more is like mm -hmm. just the, actually I kind of have on my um, YouTube and Instagram, I've done a series called um, all the things I bought because I'm a wheelchair user and how much they cost. Mm. Um Cause I just want to show people like, these are just things I need to pay for to get through my everyday life. And so right. here's the disability tax, if you will, mm -hmm. of like just getting around, you know? Like yeah. Disability tax. 
yeah. right? Just to do the basic things. So people just get up and go and do their thing. You necessarily can't. Uh, being stuck in your house. I mean, I'm, I'm a Wisconsin person. I understand what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Snow. By the snow we got, you got next, and then the cold after it and so forth. It's horrible. Yeah, I took a nice dive crash in the driveway this uh, past weekend, you know, and then that leads to problems. Yeah. Other problems, you know, like, okay, you slip and fall, you hurt yourself. Like you said, yeah, I can't, I can't walk on the ice because then I'm going to slip on that and then that's going to cause a problem. Is it, is it really FSHD cause it? I guess because the average person, I wouldn't slip on the ice like that or that easily. Yeah. And then you're damaging something else and then it just keeps going. It's just like snowballs. It's, it's like, those are the things I think the average person doesn't, doesn't think about. Um, like, yeah. oh, I slip and fall, I get up, or okay, I scratch my knee, oh, okay, maybe I hurt something, kind of. But for people that have FSHD or other disabilities, uh, it can be devastating financially, yeah. uh, physically, all of it. So, um, so yeah. then what, so what, would, what would be then the goal or advice that you give to somebody that needs the equipment? Um, you, know, you had the opportunity to kind of jump on Cobra with the past employer with insurance and so forth. There might, some people might have that option too. Mm-hmm. Um, but what's kind of your advice? Like, do you stay ahead of it? Get it sooner than you think? And what's, what's kind of your key piece at a key takeaway? Um, so that's definitely what I tried to do. And then these processes have taken, you know, one, two plus years. And so, um, doesn't always work, <laughs> but yeah, definitely staying ahead of it. You know, this van that I'm getting is going to have hand controls so I can drive. Um, I mean, I guess you always drive with your hands on the steering wheel, but so that I can do the, right. the gas and the brake with my okay. hands. Um, and that's kind of a preventative measure because I'm starting to have difficulties going from the gas to the brake. Okay. Um, and so like, that's, I don't need it now, but I will in a year or two. And I don't want to have to go through this process again yeah. of trying to get it um, funded through my state vocational rehabilitation. So I definitely would say, yeah, get ahead of it. Um, hmm. Become independently wealthy. I'm really not sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, marry rich. I don't know. Marry rich. Uh, Did you? Did you marry rich? You mentioned you had a husband. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. I did not. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, he, he, he does very well for us, but um, I, I wouldn't necessarily call us rich. No, uh, we can't buy that $106,000 van outright. So I can't just, you know, scratch off a couple off the top of the wad of cash and say we're good. Right. No. Mm-mm. Um, so can't, yeah. That kind of leads you into those other directions of start early. It sounds like do your research. Uh, you're using like local, your state uh, aid or help for it. Yeah. So every state is mandated to have a uh, vocational rehabilitation office. That's what it's called. So if you are working and you need accommodations or equipment to work or to go to school, Hmm. you can contact them and go through the process of trying to get things funded Um, because otherwise I wouldn't be able to afford this equipment. And I don't know who would. And that's why I guess I don't really have a good answer necessarily for what do you do? Because yeah. it's just, it's not in living in society with a disability is just not an equitable experience, mm-hmm. um, unfortunately. And we're trying, we're working yeah. on it, but you know, money doesn't buy happiness, but it helps. <laughs> <laughs> it does help. It does help. It, yeah. it, it helps to get out of the house, right? It helps you. Yeah. And just participate in society. Things. Like yeah. it's it's not something that I ever could have grasped the gravity of until it happened to me of like having all of these barriers put in front of you to just be able to do regular things like to just go to work for me is $150,000 that I would not not otherwise have to spend, you know, for my wheelchair and my van. So it's expensive out here. (laughs) And then, and then of course the job you have that you have to go to, you really think about it like, okay, I'm in the hole this much just to get there. How much do I have to work to get out of that? And then did it, you know, it's like, right. I looked up the other day, like how much should you be spending on a car payment? And the internet said between 10 and 20% of your monthly take home pay. So I was like, okay, how much would I have to make to make this van an outright, you know, responsible decision. And it was like $700,000 a year. That's insane. It's like the equivalent of like how much you should pay for a car. And I was like, all right, I'll just go do that then. (laughs) 
yeah, I'll just go find out what that is. Right. Right. Like, I'll just go, you know, someone's definitely just going to hand me that job that pays six figures well into the six figures. Right. Now, speaking of jobs, career and so forth, um, you have a degree in biology or zoology with wildlife. Is that, is that right? That's kind of your passion when you were younger and then. Yeah. Like, so I, I grew up always loving animals. And so when I was looking to do what to do with my life, I was like, I want to do something with animals. I'm going to figure out what to do with that. Um, and I got the advice to just get like a general degree in biology or zoology and go from there. So that's what I did. I went to Michigan state and got uh, my undergrad in zoology. Um, and then unfortunately, because I had grown up with the like, you know, let's not really talk about this thing mindset. Um, I didn't really plan ahead at all physically for what I would be able to do. So yeah. I got out of my undergrad and I went to look for jobs and they all had like essential functions that I could not do. Okay. Um, like if I could have been a field biologist, I would have done that in a heartbeat. Um, so I, I moved on and I went into, I figured, oh, well, I love animals. Zoos have animals. I want to do good for animals. I'll do animal welfare. And so I went into zoo animal welfare research work. Zoos are relatively accessible, at least on the guest side, because they have to be in America anyway. Yeah. Um, and so I pursued my master's degree in that. I went down to Jacksonville and worked at the Jacksonville Zoo for a while doing animal welfare re research. And then um, when I graduated, it happened again. Oh, wow. Um, that I... I underestimated how uh, much living near my family and friends was important to me. And yeah. so when we moved out of Michigan, I never intended on coming back because of the issues with the weather and, mm -hmm. and just, I knew I had to like not be picky about location to be successful in my chosen fields. And that just went out the window. Wow. <laughs> um, so we moved back and I got denied to a PhD program. And then I kind of had a reckoning, like, hmm. what am I going to do now? And during grad school, I kind of been getting introduced to the disability rights movement and I got really active on social media um, and just kind of connecting to and listening to people in the disability community. And I was like, this is really awesome. I want to, I want to be these people. So I completely pivoted and went into disability advocacy work and no regrets. <laughs> that yeah. PhD program denial is the best thing that ever happened to me, I think. <laughs> So it totally turned out a different um, passion point of I'm interested in this. Mm -hmm. so you're doing a lot then for for the community that you're involved with directly as we're talking about, yeah, like uh, power equipment, accessibility, and so forth, right? I mean, that's that's kind of now is that the uh, driving uh, ambitions to make those things better? Is that is that is that is that is that the goals? Is that part of that that push? Yeah, I mean, so for me specifically, and this brings in also the disabled in nature part of it is that, um, so I have this passion for being outside and animals and wildlife and the environment, and then this passion for disability advocacy. And so I love being outside. And unfortunately, so many outdoor spaces are not accessible at all. And so ideally now, the way I'd love my career to move forward is finding a way to blend the two and work in outdoor ad, uh, accessibility advocacy. Um, yeah, we uh, we went, we love, you know, going for just like little walks with our dog. And we went to a nature preserve back in like November before all the snow hit. And um, we found this, what appeared to be really, really accessible trail. There was accessible parking at the trailhead. It was paved. It was smooth. One of the smoothest boardwalks I'd ever seen. It wow. had um, variable height railings. So you could see over it, even if you were sitting down or maybe you're a child. Um, and then we got about 300 feet down the boardwalk. And my husband was a little bit of fr in front of me. And he like turned around. He's like, you are not going to believe what you're about to see. Mm. And I turned the corner and it ended to go to the rest of the trail ended in stairs. What? And that's as far as you could go. Yeah. There were miles of trails at this park and I could access like 300 feet of them. And they clearly put in so much thought to the accessibility to have it end in stairs. I was like, this is either intentional exclusion or a serious oversight. And I, uh, 
Yeah, I posted that one online in, in short form. And some people were like, well, they saved you from not getting your expensive wheelchair dirty. What? That was the response you got? That was several people said that. And I'm like, yeah, that's the takeaway. Yeah. Yeah. It's way not- to be superficial. Right. You're right. Yeah. Right. And it saved you time to clean your your power wheelchair then. Right. Wow. Which like I mean, certainly if it had been muddy, which it wasn't, that would have been a consideration that I would have taken into account. Like, do I want to proceed? Am I gonna get stuck? You know, yeah. but like yeah. the choice was taken from me from the inaccessibility, right. which Jesus was like the cares. point that people didn't understand. Yeah. Um, oh so also fighting ableism is one of my goals as well. Fighting ableism. Yeah. Okay. Describe that. Um, so a lot of the difficulties that we've been discussing and that people with disabilities have in society is the result of ableism, mm-hmm. which is the um intentional or unintentional by lack of consideration or thought um exclusion of disabled people from society from the workplace from physical places um thinking that disabled people don't belong there things like that much like racism but for disabilities exactly yeah Yeah. and i guess that's kind of um why yeah i I was i was looking forward to you describing it in those terms because that is what it is right i mean you Mm -hmm. kind of described it with that trailhead that you went to well yeah we're letting you in but only to this point yeah right like you can you can have some but just like like it took us two minutes to get there and i'm like what is what's the point what's the point you're being denied the experience um because they can't go further like it almost felt like in that certain situation i think this is throughout but we did just enough Right. To like check the boxes to say this was accessible. And there you go. Yeah. And I mean, it would have been a great place to like go and sit. Like there are a lot of benches and like turn off areas. If I were going to go like mm-hmm. birding or something, you know, it was in, in like a wooded area. So, you know, I might go back, but like, I would love to be able to mm-hmm. continue and you, like have that be my option. You think that, that, that that's ever going to get better or has it has gotten better already. I mean, that probably depends on what time period you're comparing it to. So like yeah. before the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act was signed in 1990. Certainly it's gotten better since then. Um, and I think with the advent of social media, people are becoming aware of so many more things so much faster and easier than they could have before. And so I really think of social media as a um, a, a mechanism for great change. And I think a lot of people just see like the bad parts of it, you know, the, the trolls, the hate, the, yeah. the whatever. Um, but I really think that it's definitely made me a better person. Like I've learned, been able to learn about so many things and like about people that I would never have been able to know if they didn't share their stories online, which is a big part of what motivated me to share mine. Yeah. Um, but so I definitely think that it's, it's getting better and it's going to continue to get better because I'm, I'm going to make sure <laughs> <You're> gonna make- <laughs> I'm gonna make sure. Yeah. Well, now that you're part of that army of people that are, that are doing something about it, do you find um, that that also, I guess more, let me ask it this way. The response you've, you've received, even making a shift in your career to do this, um, you know, the people that know you, or if it's social media and you, you're posting things about it, um, What's been kind of the response? You talked about obviously the people that are like, well, at least you can get your wheelchair dirty, but even like the people that are a little closer to your inner circle, you know? Yeah, I've definitely gotten some response from the FSHD community, which has been amazing. You know, like I said, it's it's difficult to meet people mm-hmm. that have this. So to have been able to, you know, post something and then have other people with FSHD be like, oh yeah, that happens to me too. Or, you know, I've had people thank me for sharing. People have been really interested in the home modifications and how much they cost yeah. little mini series. Um, so that response has been great. Of course, there's the trolls and the people that leave weird comments. And I've definitely, you know, learned some some hacks on social media of how to limit who can comment on your videos because <laughs> I, don't, I don't need that. I don't need to see that. No. Um, but as far as people in my life, I was, I was, I was surprised of how supportive everybody was because, you know, someone basically woke up one day and said, I want to be a YouTuber. Um, and yeah. Yeah. no one was like, that's silly. Why would you want to <laughs> do that? 
everyone was like, that sounds like an amazing idea. I think I've been thinking you should do this for so long. I think people are going to be interested in your story. Um, so to have that response with people close to me was really awesome. And when did that idea spawn the um, YouTube channel becoming a YouTuber uh, a creator of what you're doing um, disabled in nature? When did that all, when did that all start for you? Like, this is like, okay, this is the idea, but this is what it's going to be. And this is, this is what I'm going to talk about. This is what I'm going to, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. So it was, I was mulling around with it in my head for a couple of years um, since we moved back to Michigan and I got denied to that PhD program. And um, I have, I found a note on my phone where I jotted down like potential topics and names for the channel, like two years before I started it. Oh, wow. And, um, but the, the final catalyst was I was telling a, uh, a colleague how I rate accessible bathrooms in public spaces. And she was like, you know, I give it a, a score out of one out of 10. And she's like, you should make a YouTube channel where you go yeah. around and you rate accessible bathrooms. And I was like, <laughs> you know, that's a great idea. I'm going to do that. And so I, I bought a selfie stick and a little clip on microphone okay and that was that <laughs> the uh the bathroom series i haven't posted one in a, in a long time um is is short form content so generally a minute or less mm -hmm. um is called when nature calls oh my god <laughs> wow. i mean shout out to my mom for that one <laughs> beautiful that's great but well, that's the truth right who doesn't want to know that and like even when you look at google itself like so you look up a business or something like that Mm -hmm. like how come there isn't this you know it's accessible these bathrooms are good for access you know like, like there's nothing about that it's like there there actually, for that. is there is, there is an option on um google maps that you can turn on that tells you about the accessibility you know if they have accessible parking seating restrooms mm -hmm. entrance stuff like that but you never know if it's true right right who's checking that isn't it right. the, the company or the business because like i know for my little baseball business when i created the google for business account like i have to input all that information and either i'm inaccurate or yeah it's not you know it's like uh, you know, our entrance is accessible it. there's just a couple of steps yeah right you just have to lift your foot and blah blah blah. like no you know like that's not really what it is so it's yeah, there's accessible static, entrance but it's in the alleyway yeah yeah or even that oh yeah it's accessible as long as you climb the stairs of you know right and yeah. then we have a ramp Oh, okay or the ramp is steep it's it like that's been, accessible. that doesn't happen too often to me but it it certainly has and restrooms are a big thing i'm very passionate about restroom access mm -hmm. um because it's such a it's such a dignity issue that you don't really think about until it's taken from you what was what was probably the the series or episode that you've done on your channel that you find has been the most fun to create the most fun well i definitely do like the home modification little short series i love doing shorts they're fun little things they get a lot of engagement people find them funny or informative um so i do really like those um but as far as like long form you know if you were thinking about it, you're going to sit down and watch a youtube video i yeah. think my favorite is going to be the one that i'm starting to make about my um experience with progression at an early age um, I think that's gonna gonna be a good story to share, hopefully informative and helpful to some people that are going through it. Because one of the biggest things for me is just like having community, having people that that get it. It's such a it's such a warm feeling, such a like a a held feeling that you like you don't get unless you've experienced it. And I don't know. I'd like to have people that might identify that be able to experience that even just a little bit through my videos yeah and you've mentioned a little bit of the feedback from people especially close to you. yeah of course you should do that and it's nice right when you don't get a pushback from from the people that are closest to you you get more of a push forward like mm -hmm. we support that like they don't look at you and go well, that's silly you know right yeah it was really wonderful. how would you do that yeah then you're kind of worried you know but then even the outside minus like the trolls what's been the what's been the feedback comments etc that that you can kind of remember and and makes you feel that this is this is the right thing I'm doing. Yeah, I, I would say definitely anytime that I get a comment from a person in the FSHD community saying like, 
you know, this is, I resonate with this so much. This is exactly what I've experienced or thank you for sharing or parents of kids with early onset that are like, this is going to be so helpful for me and my kids journey, things like that. Those, those are the ones that really mean a lot to me and kind of keep it going when the trolls are otherwise oh. popping off. Yeah. <laughs> That's good, right? I mean, that's the motivation. That's that's you're doing it for the right reasons. You're always going to get people that are going to be negative. There's not much you can you can necessarily do about that. However, you did say you are figuring out ways to stop them from commenting. So that's yeah. Important. You can limit your comments. Look in those uh, settings. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't think I'm as quite as web savvy. I mean, I don't think too many people know that. Hey, when this stuff gets recorded, I just like get up and leave, and then the FSHG site goes, "Yeah, we'll post that." Okay, great. <laughs> I used to do a lot more of that maybe before things got uh, so social media frenzy like it is now. Um, but uh, yeah, it is it is a great resource. You know, you put yourself out there. Uh, you decided to do that. Not everybody can, um, yeah. which leads me to the next question. Those that are a little bit, if you call it denial or if you call it, you just want to be quieter about the disease. Um, you know, what do you say... I mean, it's, we don't want to convince them to do opposite of what they feel that is comfortable for them. But do you believe that though there should always some be a certain point in your life where you kind of have to come out about it, having FSHD? I will. I will say this because um, I definitely think that you're right. Like, there's not you. You can't force anyone to do something that they're not ready for, and this is you know gradually losing your ability to do things is a very personal and very emotional journey. And I don't fault anyone for where they are in their process. I can look back over, you know, things that I've journal entries I've written or things that I've, you know, recorded in the past and be like, man, I've come a long way. But if you would have tried to tell me, if I were to go back in time and tell me then what I know now, I would have been like, no, 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 I don't believe you. Yeah. Um, I don't believe that you're okay with being a wheelchair user or that like you share your story online, get out of here. I don't believe you. Right. Um, But I will say that I wish I would have Mm. like, I wish that when I was younger and I was going through the first like really serious bout of losing things that I would have been able to see that it didn't mean my future was doomed, that walking wasn't everything. If I can stress anything to anyone, it's that walking isn't everything. Wheelchairs are freedom. They are wonderful tools that once I start using a wheelchair, um, I got so much of my life back and I wasn't exhausted all the time. I didn't have to ration my energy. I could do things that I have long lost the ability to do that I loved. Um, including a lot of outdoor stuff. So I think I would love to shift the mindset in our community that wheelchairs or mobility devices equals failure and that you have to be at the point of absolute exhaustion to give in to use them. I would love it if we didn't see it that way. Mm. That's interesting because mm-hmm. I'm definitely one of those people that... Um, and, hey, I get I'm it. Wheelchair and I'm like, nah. now granted, I can definitely walk. And But to your point about you know, conserving your energy, how much can I do? This and this, it's like momentum is key for me. The day starts, it's momentum, momentum, momentum. I got and just because you can doesn't mean you should. Right. And yeah, yeah. And then by the end of the day, I'm like, Ugh. it's like that was that was tougher than I thought it was going to be, or this or that. And I work at a nonprofit where we give medical equipment away, including power equipment. So there's like power wheelchairs that we'll just hand someone if they need it. And yeah, it's yeah. been passed on or it's been donated. Uh, it's a medical lending library, but it's not really lent. Like you keep it as long as you need it. So Fun. those kind of places are all over. So when these get donated, these pieces of equipment, um, the volunteer staff will look at me and say, well, here, Tim, can you put this in our inventory? Blah, blah, blah. You may ride around and test it. And I'm like, no, it's all right. Why don't you drive around and test it? Like, why? I'm like, eh, if I start doing that, then yeah, no, go ahead. Just do that. Like I, I literally get to that point. I like, I won't even take this thing for a spin. Because I feel like, no, I'm going to, I don't want to be comfortable in that idea yet. Yeah. And I mean, I definitely, I get that mindset because I've, I've been there, you know, um, a long time ago. Well, long time ago with regards to me um, yeah. in my relative lifespan. Right. Um, but, and I, I totally get it. And I think it's because of this rhetoric that 
society gives is that disability is bad and using a device is giving in. And if you're not completely able-bodied, you're not worth as much. And so we put that off as long as we can, even though it's it, wrong. it would be I, so I'm much better to just right. use the thing because it's a tool to make your life better. And I would say you might not have fallen in the driveway <laughs> if you had been sitting down. <laughs> true, <laughs> true, true, true. This is true. Yeah. And I, I make was that joke that. sometimes. So like um, my husband's grandparents are like starting, they're like in their eighties, they're starting to fall a lot. And I'm like, you know what you should do to stop falling? Stop walking. <laughs> That's hilarious. They don't think it's quite as funny as no, I no, do. I, no, no, no. <laughs> and you say it that way? Cause it's very good. Yeah. yeah. It's a good. They never take my advice. Uh, I don't know why. Yeah. Well, that's something too that I noticed within um, your uh, YouTube videos and, and, and things that you post. You have great timing. There's there's good humor in there. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, stand up might be your thing too. I'm just saying. I don't know. If you have the right material. Um, I rely then, heavily on editing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's well is well done. It's well done. I think video yeah. editing is one of your talents then too, because uh, uh, they are they are great episodes. I think I think people need to definitely dive into it. It is uh, it is it is phenomenal. Disabled. Check it out. It's a fun time. It's a time. It is. It is a fun time. We talk um, about all things that are disabled in nature, and sometimes we go outside. That's a great line. Thank you. <laughs> that is a great line. Yeah. And I, I named it that because I didn't want to like pigeonhole myself into having to do like just outdoor things. Because mm -hmm. I wanted to discuss like all of the aspects of life yeah. living with a disability. But like yeah. I also want to advocate for outdoor accessibility because I just want to walk more than 300 feet down a trail without being confronted by stairs you know right and why not i mean come on yeah these people yeah. on their stairs i don't understand yeah what's the big deal right? so overrated this is so yeah. they're tired stairs and curbs why do they exist <laughs> <laughs> true truth yes yes oh man so to to kind of there's there's so much i will definitely have, to have you on more as you get more episodes more um more content Sure, um, yeah, especially the path on. with the um, early onset. I want to see how that goes and maybe bring it back and almost exclusively talk about that. That would be a great thing to do. Yeah. But um, it kind of like the last question I have for you is uh, in regards, I guess, to advice for those, I, I give that question a lot. But for you, as you were talking, <clears throat> I kind of wanted to shift it just a slight. And maybe it's more of a, because you are one of the early onset, you know, I don't know how to... Uh, that's when you were diagnosed, right? When you're earlier in your life, mm -hmm. and now you're a little you know, later in your life, and you've kind of weathered through those things uh, when you were younger. And so then, maybe more the question is, what advice do you give if it's to the parents of of the kids that are tackling this at a young age, or even the kids themselves? You know, what's what's some of that advice that you would you do would give to them if you could? Mm, yeah, I definitely think that advice I would give would to be, you know, to go back and fix what I feel like I wish could have happened when I was a kid. And that is, don't be afraid to talk about it. Mm. You know, don't let them live in silence. Don't put any shame around what's happening to them. Cause you know, it's, it's, it's full of like the process is full of grief, but it's like being disabled is a, is a neutral, you know, it's not good. It's not bad. It's a neutral. So mm. I feel like if you can have just a matter of fact, but sort of positive outlook on what they're experiencing. I think that would have helped me a lot um, to find peers that I could have talked to, you know, if I would have, goodness, if I would have had someone with early onset that was also, you know, around my same age, that was also going through mm -hmm. what I was going through to be able to talk to, that would have changed my life. Mm -hmm. uh, that would have meant literally everything to me. Mm -hmm. Um and the second would be that, you know, even if it's your kid and I understand the, like we were talking about the, the stigma and the, the, the really difficult feelings that surround using mobility aids, I would really just challenge yourself to cast that stigma aside and see them as a tool to freedom. You know, if your kid's losing the ability to run or walk, if they were to use a wheelchair, you know, especially a power wheelchair, I can go very fast yeah. in my power wheelchair. Okay. So folks, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that if I would have been presented with that opportunity to proudly use a mobility aid when I was that young, 
that mm. also would have made all the difference for me. And maybe I wouldn't have gone through so much grief because I wouldn't have had to have lost mm. all those abilities or missed out on all those experiences that I did. You know, maybe I wouldn't have my marching band tr- Disney World trip trauma huh. that I do that I will talk about in a video sometime. <laughs> Stay tuned. Yeah, right? that one time at band camp, uh, I got everlasting <laughs> trauma. Let's talk about it. <laughs> but the fact that you're willing to do that, you're you even willing to tease it. That's hey, we're gonna we're I'm gonna talk about this very yeah. Oh, I think if you don't have humor about things, even ones that are really serious, like yeah. you're gonna have a much harder time going through it. So I think that humor is also key. There we go. That's my third piece of advice. There you go. That's that's all great advice. That's all great advice. And I'm glad that uh, you're on to give that advice. And we get to see more of that through Disabled in Nature, your YouTube channel. You are an official YouTuber. Is that is that what it is? See how old I am? You see what's happening, Marissa? I can't even, you know, phrase it, it seems like properly or describe it properly. You know, I'm not sure what the definition of YouTuber is. If you define it as someone that records themselves and puts that up on the YouTube platform, then I suppose I'm a YouTuber. And that's um, what you are. I do also have a full-time job, so it's not like I'm not one of these YouTubers that's like raking in millions of dollars, you know? <laughs> Yet, yet, <laughs> yet. <laughs> you never yeah. know. You never know. Manifest. Yes, yes. If that's if that's what happens, it happens. You know. I also um, have an accompanying Instagram. If you're on the Instagram platform, um, we share extras, mm-hmm. little oh, additional yeah. shenanigans on the Instagram. Nice. nice. And what's uh, the Instagram handle on that? Or it's disabled in nature. Really same. Also on TikTok, it's all like the same as far as like videos go out. It's all the same videos. Um, but like on Instagram, that's, I really love Instagram because it's a great platform to like connect on a personal level with people. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm. and you can like really have, there's lots of ways to really directly interact with your audience on Instagram. So I really enjoy that platform a lot. Excellent. So everybody check it out. It is disabled in nature. Thanks Marissa for joining us. Thanks Uh, so much for having me. Be safe, stay warm in Michigan as I'm, uh, you know, yeah, here from Wisconsin across the lake. So yeah, we're going through it together. <laughs> That's right. You know? Yeah. It's going to warm up here eventually. Cold. Yeah. Eventually, eventually it's, you know, June and then you get like three months of, of decent weather and then it's yeah. like over again. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I do wish you the best. Thank you very much. We're definitely going to keep watching and we'll stay in touch and get you back on as just yeah. more content rolls out. I think it's really exciting to see and um, want to have you back. So. Thanks for joining I'm, us this time. We'd be happy to come back. Excellent. Excellent. That is Marissa. Check her out. Uh, Marissa from Michigan, Disabled in Nature, uh, our featured guest today on the FSHD Society radio show. So uh, as we look forward to um, closing up shop here, um, wrapping things up, some key points I guess I wanted to highlight and what I listen to with our guests. Some people have asked me this. I've gotten a couple uh, either in person questions or uh, once in a while an email. Tim, what do you what do you write? And you know, most interviewers don't do that. They're reading off the questions they already have prepared or this and that. And some of it, you know, I have notes, of course, and research things I've done about our guests or about what they're going to talk about, what we're going to talk about. Sometimes there's some pre conversation I have with them, a little kind of peeking you behind the curtain what the process is. But yes, I do. I, I kind of take quick notes here or there. Um, because to me, it's it's about keywords. Um, keyword in this interview, words in this interview for me were were grief uh, for sure. Um, find find your peers. Disabled is neutral. Interesting, interesting. Uh, good takeaways from that. See, many of you know I'm a baseball coach, and when I coach, I go to sometimes coach clinics or talk to other coaches, ones that. Um, I either know of personally or don't, and I steal ideas from them or have the great opportunity to sit and talk with them. And when I listen to to what they do in their craft and what they do, it's like certain keywords stick out or certain paths or certain drills I can do. I kind of do similar in my interview process with our great guests. So for Marissa, those keywords stuck out. In particular, grief I've heard before, similar to when I was diagnosed, my uh, manager at the time who has MS that was the advice she gave me. You're going to grieve this. Never even thought about that. Why? How could I? Right? That's all. That's very profound. And we've heard that before. Uh, a disability is is neutral. Is interesting. Um, 
maybe when we have her back on, we'll ask more about that. And then lastly, that finding my peers, you know, other other kids that had FSHD to connect with, which would be difficult, no question, but possible, especially with FSHD having the early onset group, there's another avenue. And then the word that kind of spawned off of that was one that my brother would always tell me. He'd say, Tim, you got to find your tribe. And I've had another past coach that I respect very much that would say, you know, I don't tell the players we're a family because not everybody's family is that great. Not everybody's had a great family experience. So to say, this is like your family is sometimes not a really good comparison. But that coach would tell me about a tribe. Those are people that are that are come together by choice for a common goal for that community they've created. And then when my brother has used that term to me um, in the past, he said he has always told me that. You just got to find your tribe. You got to find the people that you are supposed to be with and around. It's not necessarily family. And I think that's also great advice. I think with the FSHD side, I think that is part of it. We are finding our tribe. We're being a part of that. And I'm glad you're part of this. Um, I teased it last episode, and I'll continue to. The FSHD Society radio show is going to change and morph into something a little different. These two episodes have kind of teased with that, meaning like we're not going to completely flip the thing upside down and reinvent everything. But definitely the formatting and what we're going to talk about, the content, very much so, is going to be about the people with the disease. And I'm going to reach out a little deeper into my opinions about certain things or what I hear in, 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 the, in the group and things that you know I respect or things I'm puzzled about or even things I get irritated about. I'm going to say something about it. Um, we're going to open up that door a little more as we walk forward into 2024 with these episodes. Things will change. Things will change um, to that aspect. But I'm still here. I'm here for this community. I want to hear from you. Marissa reached out to the show. For that reason, because you wanted to be on the show, you want to be on the show, you know someone that wants to be, the door is wide open for you. FSHD Radio at FSHDsociety.org is the way to go. That goes right to me. doesn't go through a screener and then to me, to me. In my inbox, have it open right now and fill it up with show ideas. You want to be a guest, a topic we should talk about. Have a question for me. Look how many possibilities, right? All just through an email. And I'll interconnect with you. Marissa said it too. Like we connected quickly when she reached out. Boom, we had a show booked within a day. Uh, I want to make that connection with the group because you are the people that I want to talk to. You are the ones I want to meet, and I want to bring content to you that you want. So let's get connected. Let's do that. Send me those emails. Fill it up. Fill the inbox, and uh, let's get connected. So thanks again for being on the show, watching, listening. However you find us. We're at every, pretty much any podcast platform you can find, which is how I listen to my podcast. Some people watch. So, hey, we're on YouTube as well. I don't think that makes me a YouTuber though, Marissa, but you are definitely. And thank you to Marissa for joining us and being our featured guest today. Look forward to the next episode to share with you all. Until then, take care. You've been listening to the FSHD Society Radio Show.